Happy New Year, everybody. This is Smitty, and Talking Schmidt is back. First episode of 2024, and we got a good one for you today. It's Hansi Driscoll reporting in from Grass Valley with a sidekick that I got, my homie from across the bay, Antonio Stincho. You might know him as Toad. We're going to talk to Hansi and get caught up on what's been going on up in the uh, gold country. I'd like to say a couple things before we get started, though. Um, I've been thinking about this long and hard, and, uh, you know, every year we try to improve upon things, make things a better place, try to do things good for you all, and uh, maybe do something good for me as well. You know how it goes. Anyhow, I am looking for contributors. So what I'm trying to do is get some help here in 2024. My executive director is in the works with a Patreon page that could be hitting soon if we are happy with it. I'm not exactly sure what all that means, but people have told me that we should have a Patreon page. What the fuck is that? Graphic designers, where are you? Bro, I need that. If you want to give me a New Year's present by creating a new Talking Schmidt intro, animation graphic to replace the current one i think it's time for a change and i would love to see what you guys got out there the turbulence of like wow all this information you can send me to talkingschmidt at gmail.com i'm also on the gram instagram talkingschmidt big shout out to all of you that helped me get rid of my inventory at the end of the year shout out big shout out to the skate shops that have supported me shout out big shout out to reno too shout out i just want to say shout out classic skate shop thank you for always having my show on youtube video style in your shop and sending me a little blurb man that's why i keep going i gotta be honest like i love the fact that a skate shop has our podcast up for kids to come in and just peep it and see what's going on oh fuck! it's finally here hey blood wizard's been supporting talking schmidt since day one antonius is my friend justin visser is my friend these guys run blood wizard mammy was on the program but here's a call to action. Let's get some blood wizards on the show. Oh my God. Hey, I also want to give a shout out to Grant Taylor. GT, shout out. maybe the best there ever was, is, and will ever be. Homie sent me a big package of stickers. I was hyped. You know how much I like stickers. I got his dad's uh, Thomas Taylor sticker up immediately. And I'm going to, I'm thinking about trying to, get a different backdrop or add to it and stuff 2024 kids this is a lot of brain waves are getting used on this maybe it's all that magic mind i'm drinking who knows you just influenced somebody talking schmidt listeners you have sent in your clips i've edited them shane mednich the sm project has provided the soundtrack but this weekend i will be premiering old dogs new year you mean no comprende you're not going to want to miss this saturday morning before your cartoons and after your breakfast sip some coffee it's old dogs new year when you bring it you gotta sing it talking schmidt at gmail.com and uh shout out to reno shout out yes this is hansi driscoll and you're listening to talking schmidt Hey, 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 Talking Schmidt. I'm already not watching. It's cool, like tonight is the night. Damn, this is like the coolest thing I'm ever gonna do. I wouldn't say it was fun. What do you mean? Well, Christian Fletcher's younger brother. Fuck the Dodgers. Oh, big dog's in. What do you think, Dolan? John, Schmitty, Talking Schmidt. Alpha Macaroni. Most of these guys, their opinion don't matter. Talking Schmidt, right? And skateboarding. I remember that. Talking Schmidt. What are you doing? Holy shit. Skateboarding, homies. No, Schmidt, you can't jump in. What is happening? Yay! Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi check one, Wi-Fi check two. All right, guess what? It's 2024. It's January. And I got two guys that grew up together up in the hills. 
Lake of the Pines, Grass Valley, Nevada City, Auburn, Cardiel, Sen. We're going to talk about it all today. Adrenaline skateboards, you might have heard of it. I got Toad sitting in with me, and today's focus is going to be on Hansi Driscoll. Hell yeah. Hansi, how are you? Doing good. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. This is awesome, honestly. Good. Thank Hyped. you both. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Toad. Yeah. Thank you so much. Toad was telling me about, um, I didn't even know there's a place called Morning Sun, and that's kind of where you started or no? Yep. The family, my family built a, um, like a multi-purpose tiny tennis court, like the size of like a third of a tennis court. Is it wiffle ball, the round balls that have holes in them? They would do, it's yeah. not like tennis. Yeah. Wiffle ball, and they had a basketball hoop and stuff. And my stepdad, my dad here in Grass Valley side, I was uh, just went nuts about skating, like how most of us did. Just It was just an instant true love. And so I was like, I had all the thrashers and the pictures on the wall. And um, this is when Thrasher did the ramp plans. You uh -huh. could order the ramp Thrasher. And uh, we bought um, the five-foot quarter pipe. <laughs> and that quarter pipe went to Vert. And it was five, five foot with no just the perfect, way. just no. Just, yeah. And so it all started with this. Oh, and it was four feet wide. But what, wh why were you even thinking skateboarding at that moment? Like what drew you to like skateboarding? Like how, how are you thinking that? So my stepdad's uncle was doing a surf shop in Santa Rosa called uh, Surf Plus. Wow. And he started carrying, yeah, and he started carrying skateboards. And uh, one year, Christmas or something, Easter, he did his annual visit to Grass Valley and he brought a skateboard and I just freaked out. Like everything about it, I was just like so stoked. And um, our pool was being worked on at the time and like he tried to skate our pool, but it was too steep a transition. No, and I was funny. like, when he took off, I was just like butt boarding and just like, just freaked out, just wanted to roll on it and stuff. And I launched that thing into the deep and in the water. <laughs> and he was like super bummed. And I was just like, didn't even under understand that skateboards can't get wet. I didn't know anything. I was just like, you're stoked. like, how old? Like around eight or so? Like, how old are you? Ten. Ten? Wow. Okay. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but so your parents build this tennis court place and you order a ramp from the Thrasher ramp plans and you can take yes. it from there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was awesome because it ended up being like the that ramp stuck out through my whole time of having all these different ramps. And I built a mini ramp, then I built a mini spine ramp that was two and a half feet tall. And and um, I had heated sessions with Chris Sin and Cardiel. And, um, but at this ramp, my family is construction workers, so he ordered this thing and he made it with me. So, like, he that was part of the ramp plans was like having me, you know, we bought the wood and then we did the this and that. And um, that thing was awesome. It was awesome. We, we ended up building a full street course with like a little street handrail, which was like way ahead of its time. And uh, no I mean, way. We're at this when boards had shape and it was just launch ramps and um yeah i talked no. to cardiel and he said you basically had jump ramps everywhere yes yeah and then some of them were too crazy so we'd build a deck and it'd be like some wacky type of quarter pipe okay dude that, that five foot ramp was seriously so gnarly it, like it was five feet went to vert four feet wide Ponzi did all sorts of tricks on it. He could do rock and rolls when I met him. Like and I was just learning how to skate. He was like, he was like sixth grade doing rock and rolls on it. Like it was gnarly. It was crazy. What else is going on up up there at this time? Are you guys getting into rivers and hiking and doing jumps into water and stuff, or 
like what kind of other things are you doing that's kind of like kid stuff daredevil y or BMX in or whatever? Yeah. All the all the above. You're exactly <laughs> right. All the above, just total country, you know, doing that, just the rivers and uh I had a BMX, but Toad and Cardiel were really good at BMX. So I like kept up um when I lived in Lake the Pines later on. Uh-huh. When we became like close friends during around high school time. It was a good time. My friend Gabe Copeland actually messaged me recently talking about the old ramp setup. And he said we were laughing about how parks are available for the kids growing up these days. And then he said that uh he said if it wasn't for me building ramps, we would have never even known how to skate transition back then. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, that's something that kids take for granted now. But when we grew up, like, if you knew somebody that had a ramp, you you were their friend because there wasn't a lot of friend. I mean, a lot of ramps or tranny and yeah. skate parks kind of died like at a certain thing. And then it was just basically, like you said, building little jump ramps and stuff. But like to have actually tranny to coping and stuff was yeah. not super common for people to have the ability to learn on. Yeah, absolutely. And it funneled all the skaters into certain spots. Like there's tons of spots now, but if there was only like three ramps in town, the sessions would be really awesome. Yeah. There's our friend, I'm not sure if you know about the Beeble Bowl, the Clover Bowl. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had a mini ramp. Okay. Growing. He, it was like the only other mini ramp in town, basically. Dude, that thing was awesome. That thing was awesome. Was one of those mini ramps the one with an extension that John skating in the Dogtown video and doing like the cross Oh bone? my God. Was the Auburn ramp? That ramp was insane. Garrett's okay. ramp. That Garrett. thing was so awesome. It was like uh, it was maybe, thirty-two feet wide. Yeah, yeah. It looks so sick. It was moved up with too big of transition, so it was built kind of technically wrong, but it made it super fun because I mean, you had, had this big like whoa, like long. Yeah transition thing and it was really mellow at the top still mm. i think it was 10 foot tranny with like seven foot tall yeah. with eight, eight it foot. was funny dude it was funny but you could really like learn stuff and uh get away with more because you didn't have to come all crazy yeah it wasn't too tight yes it wasn't tight at all well, how like did a nose blunt on it or something Hans? So i can't remember but yeah yeah i got some stuff Brad, well, how would you compare like um, John and Chris at at the early age? Like, what what kind of kids were they? Like meeting them and like seeing them in the early stages. It was always absolutely incredible. Just completely <laughs> a different level than everyone else. Just one hundred percent always, and it was really funny because uh, they were from two sides of the spectrum of like the skate scene at the time. Like Chris Sin was clean cut pal during the sponsor time. Right. And Carl was dog town, dude. And he was chain wallets and he was chewing. Yep. Was bla uh, black Sabbath suicidal tendencies. Yeah. And we had different skate groups and we we're in the same town, but we're in a different 15 minutes different and when you're a kid you know you stick to your groups because people aren't driving as much so we had our like skate group and then grass valley had its kind of skate group okay I think they were they were sober at the time too or they were straight edge yeah, huh? chris yeah chris and like the whole crew i think salmon was in that crew like maybe wow Rachel, those guys they were all straight edge yeah they're kind of wearing it like <laughs> They're like straight edge. We're straight edge. Like uh, we were coming from a wild, wild, you know, walk on the wild side. Okay. And and since you guys are up in the mountains, are you like the minute snowboarding comes out, are you on it? Like, are you some of the, are you doing some of the earlier snowboarding than before they it actually were. gets? Yeah. And I played with it too. I had a lot of fun with it. It was awesome. Because you're but, only like, what, 45 minutes away from 
right? Absolutely. But Toad and John really were just exceptional snowboarders and loved it and kicked butt. I remember Toad uh, getting out of high school and hitchhiking. Yeah, Toad. Well, there was like always groups that were going, so I'm not sure if it was technically hitchhiking or maybe just asking friends at high school. We used to all hitchhike a lot, though. Remember, we'd hitchhike to Grass Valley to go skate. We'd yes. go link up with like Chris. Like we'd go to like Beeble's Ramp, and then Chris would be there. It'd be like Hansi, John, and I. We'd go. We'd hitchhike together, and we'd have to like watch out for our parents in case our parents were driving up the freeway. We'd be like, yeah. you have to pull your thumb down and be like, "Whoa, we're not hitchhiking." <laughs> Remember that shit, Hans? Like it was yes. kind of sketchy. If our parents caught us hitchhiking, they would have been so pissed. <laughs> yes. I, you know, I was driving up Cascade Shores the other day past where Beatles was. And do you remember the t- day where we, when you, John, and I hitchhiked to Eric Beebelheimer's, and then we had to walk from Nevada City up there, and there was that pipe that went across. Okay, there was the driveway, and then there's a ditch, and then there's this thick, round pipe that went across the creek. And Cardiel, and this is like bigger wheels days, and Cardiel comes down the hill. He's like, oh, hike. <laughs> There's this big pipe went across the creek. And Cardiel barged into the dirt and ground across the pipe over the creek. Sick. <laughs> I bet there was all kinds of shit like that just going on. Because I, 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 I figure like in those early days, I just remember seeing like, dudes doing gainers out of like some crazy like a tree or something into a river like yeah. people are just like going for it in a way that like because i grew up in the suburbs so like that kind of stuff was kind of foreign to me so seeing like that kind of shit always was like oh that probably mentality is like of course you're gonna skateboard like you're like just already wilding out and you're on the bike and all those things him and i'm telling you For the entire month of January, you can get one month free of these Magic Mind Elixirs when you subscribe for three months. Go to www.magicmind.com forward slash Jan, as in January, Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-T. So that's J-A-N-S-C-H-M-I-T. And with my code, Schmidt20, you're going to get an extra 20% off, which gets your grand total to a whopping 75% off. Not a lot, you know, there's not a lot of offers out there that are comparable, comparable. Again, this only lasts until the end of January. So hurry up before it goes away. That's magicmind.com forward slash Jan Schmidt with the code Schmidt 20. Get yours today and be prepared to have your mind on some magic and some magic on your mind. Your ping pong game may drastically be improved. Blood wizard. Blood wizard. Blood wizard. Blood wizard. Hey, it's Corey at Blue Plate, 3218 Mission Street. Come see us. Meatloaf, fried chicken, deviled eggs, Dollar Olympia beers. We're here every day of the week. We got a garden and we got smiles on our faces. Come let us make you happy. Hey, what's up? This is Mark Suchu and you're listening to Talking Schmidt. How, so how does the origin story go for adrenaline? Like, who do you meet and how does it kind of, the idea come along? Well, Chris really lightened up. Like when he was younger, he was like on pal and he was kind of like, uh, like Toad said, they were kind of like, uh, he was competitive. He was competitive and he was like, uh, I love Chris so much. He is such an incredible artist and his art, it just translates to everything he does, including his skateboarding is just absolutely incredible. And, um, he really, lightened up man he like uh his whole vibe changed and then like so we started skating more and um 
he just asked me one day, we were really skating and I was like getting stuff from venture and I wrote for race wheels and I was starting to get in the mix. And, uh, uh, I was Chris's pick and Strubin was Jai's pick. And that was pretty much how it started basically. Okay. So that's what I heard. And I didn't want to even say it. I wanted to hear you say it, but, um, so basically Sen and Jaya, were they, did it start at, um, high speed? I mean, with yeah. Fausto, <clears throat> did yeah. Fausto like give them the opportunity or how did, do you know? I'm not sure. I think it was through think, but yeah. I'm not sure. And so it was, it was Jaya and Chris starting mm -hmm. a company and, and the formula was we're each going to pick an am. I think so. Yes. And they wanted to start something fresh, obviously. And, uh, they're both such great people that I think they wanted to represent on people from that. They knew from skating all the time. So and at first, is them. it just you four? Um, I think, uh, Noah Slaznik and Roger Selinger. Okay. And Cause that's I never knew Noah was a part of it. Me either. Yeah. I'm tripping. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that um, was the original um you know, right when it started. Absolutely right when it started. Okay. Because those guys both kind of like you know were busy doing other things or so I'm not sure, but it, you know, it, we kind of needed the like hardcore skaters that are being in the thrasher videos and uh getting the stuff for slap magazine and thrasher so so what was there any early like did you guys go on any trip together or anything like when it's first starting out or like do you remember like i don't know some like demo or something you guys went to or anything where it's like you felt some camaraderie as like war adrenaline yeah, I mean, I kicked I, at this point. I was hanging out with Chris a lot. Okay, and uh, he had a house down Terraval with Rico Castro. <laughs> Rico, and, shout out! Yeah, <laughs> and so I was driving down from high school and just going there as much as I could on the weekends and staying with Chris and Rico, and um, and we were just having the best time, man. A bunch of Grass Valley small town guys that uh, we're now living in the city. So we were just stoked to skate everything, dude. Every little bank, every just whatever, dude. It was all awesome to us, you know. Was this before Sick Boys? No, Sick Boys was, uh, <laughs> Toad and I loved Sick Boys when we were. Uh, we all did, right? <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was so good. Nor Hansi Pete, it. you know, Hansi like. Hansi owned it. So we, I would go up to Hansi's house to watch it. Like, dude, we got to watch that video again. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, well, one one time Toad was staying over and it started raining, so we just put down Masonite in my room, and with there's like a chest, like a opening chest, to like put your shoes in or something, and we set that thing up and we're just doing all the axle stalls in my little room. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. The reason I brought up Sick Boys is because McIntyre made that um, video, but I think he was inspired by going off, which was kind of Jaya's version of Sick mm. Boys. And awesome. so, you know what I mean? It was like all Super 8 and filmed kind of similar, and, and Jaya yeah. just killed every spot in Santa Cruz. Um, mm. You yes. knew Jaya real well. Uh, it'd be cool to hear some Jaya stories for sure. Jaya, if you don't know, like I can't imagine someone listening to this podcast right now that doesn't know that Jaya was an amazing human being, an amazing photographer. He was kind of like Chris where it's like everything he did, he excelled at it. He was so special, such a special soul, unique, incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that movie going off, like, I, the stuff he does in that video is insane. It looks like it's all done in one day or something. Too. <laughs> yeah. Like, what, how did he do all that in one day? Back then, in like the, I don't know, mid late eighties, just unreal. I think he was embarrassed by it. <laughs> oh, really? I think so because I remember he had it at his house, at your house, one time, and we put it on, and he was all, "No, no." <laughs> oh, 
Oh, wow. That's funny. Because I've never seen it. <laughs> he was pretty humble, like kind of like cons- like quiet a little bit to the point where I yeah. kind of thought he didn't like me uh, at yeah. first. Because I would see him all the time, but you would kind of get this like, kind of, okay, hey, like, uh, maybe he doesn't like me. And then we got to be friends. I was like, dude, I used to think you hated me or something, (laughs) (laughs) you know? But, um, dude, he, we would see him at the San Jose warehouse all the time with, uh, what's his name? No, the other Noah, the photographer guy Mm -hmm. from Martin. No. Yeah. Noah Martin. No, those guys would be uh, hanging out and stuff. Um, around that time did you is that when you moved to santa rosa or do you move did you move to santa rosa later i moved to santa rosa later i'm uh there at terrible and i went up to santa rosa right out of high school i mean just literally like the first week i was out of is that because your uncle lived there yeah and uh because i started uh those guys became some of my best friends instantly grass valley had its we had our skate crew but in santa rosa a big part of them were already sponsored and doing it and john miner's filming the whole time john miner's always been a filmer yeah and um brian gaberman and charlie watts and joel price Mm -hmm. oh and also sean delinsky sean John Dolinsky lived in Santa Rosa and he was uh, really would help me out a lot. I mean, he would have spots lined up for me. He shot photos. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that was a big rush to be able to like take pictures and have potential to be in the magazine. So, Uh uh-huh. Yeah, when that skate park <clears throat> was there, we used to go up there, and that's when we started meeting them. And of course, Joel skated for uh, Think, so yeah. I was already in the Think camp. And then Joel kind of introduced me to Minor and those dudes. But I mean, talk about like artistic, like everybody involved so far that you mentioned. Like you mentioned Gaberman, you mentioned Minor, you mentioned jaya sen these are all artistic people that like rip on a skateboard but like they they look at life in an artistic way and Uh, they're really special right it's like uh, these are all unique people gaberman's one of the best photographers straight up and miner's one of the best filmers straight up manzuri's one of the best filmers straight up like you know what i mean it's like chris sen was skater of the year john cardiel was skater of the year like there's all this amazing talent in this group that you're hanging out with. Like, do you feel that? Or is this just like, I don't know any difference. So there's the norm. It was the norm. It really was. <laughs> it's so crazy. Cause you yeah, know, it was, we, we didn't trust it. We're all such freaks, really freaks <laughs> of the scene, you know, mm. it was, uh, that was just what was going down. And, uh, so we were just that was life <laughs> were did you get um like did you work on a project with delinsky did you get like an interview in the mag or anything that like you actually went out and tried to like put together something um it was uh um one-off things so i never got a full interview but i got like uh a small interview, one page, uh, I think it was slap. And then, um, they would do those like intro introduction, uh, like someone new to the scene. Mm. It was like little, I forget what it was called. They called it, but I got one of those like hot shoes or something, something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And Toad, are you in the picture yet? Do you guys know no, each other? Well, I would go. Yeah, I mean, we were always hanging out or whatever. But like when he would come to when Hans would come to the city, I lived in the Sunset District when Chris and Rico lived together. Mm. So I'd go down there a lot and hang out. I wasn't on a lot of these sessions or anything though. I was kind of going to school and stuff and doing my thing. But um, I would try to link up as much as I could. I loved hanging out with everybody, the crew, because. I would live to, I moved to the city before everybody. And then I, I moved when I was in high school and like, I got torn away from my crew. You know, I was just like, fuck, like I didn't have a crew Mm. anymore. So I'd go to Embarcadero and try to hang out. And I was just like, 
I just always felt like I was this country kid that just didn't really kind of totally fit, but I like forged it a little bit and like became friends with like some of those dudes. Like to like, I feel like I know Chico now because of that, or like, you know, some of those people where I like, I'm, I can say a friendly hello. But then like once everyone moved down, like two years later, I was like, Oh, my crew's here. Like I'm, I'm going to go hang out with my crew now, you know, like, yeah, it was, it was, it was it was pretty amazing i was so hyped that everyone moved down because i was like it was a little weird it was definitely not i don't know it's hard to fit in when you're like a block trying to fit into a round hole you know you're like that's not right not <laughs> <laughs> like totally, what you know, do you remember as being some of the regular spots like did you have regular spots or would you try to just skate new spots all the time like would you start at like let's say miley or emb or somewhere and then take it from there or like how, how, what do you remember about spots it was wide open sf man we would just go ski everything uh. absolutely everything i mean later on um in the later years when i moved there at the adrenaline house 197 uh dubose right um, Trode and i we're starting to like have maybe a little bit of a routine like a uh, clipper and certain stuff. But um, back then we were just, you know, just starstruck by live, being in the city and like, let's go here, let's go there. Let's just go everywhere. It was just awesome. Mm, for sure. I, I was always just inspired by Tommy Guerrero back then. Right. I mean, we'd see those old pal videos and I think we were all, we were just trying to find that. We're, we're like trying to the find where to the Tommy top and then bomb down. Absolutely. Yeah. And we were trying to find those streets where Tommy was skating. You know, we're like, where are those things? Where are they? All the, the things go down the hill. We're trying to find all the <laughs> Yeah. Did you ever see Tommy in the wild? A couple times. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Do you remember kind of early on? I mean, to me, I always say this, like, and Tommy t tells me to shut up, but like, Tommy's Tommy. Like, for me, he's Tommy Guerrero. He's like San Francisco street skater that inspired all of Northern California and probably way more people like Trehobo and all these people that were on the East Coast that came to San Francisco. Why'd they come? Because they saw the hills in the mag and they saw Tommy's pal part straight up. Yeah. You know? That's beautiful. So I, to me, Tommy needs to be in the conversation when you talk about Nottis and, and Gons and the early street skaters. Like Tommy oh. is fucking, he's, he's for me, because it's San Francisco and I take pride in this area. Like Tommy's our guy. Yes, I'm with you. I loved Animal Chin. I just freaked out about Animal Chin movie. <laughs> But Tommy Guerrero's part is what translated because those big ramps, man, that was just that, you know, in the early, late eighties or whatever, when Vert was starting to become less of the focus point, mm. you just, it wouldn't translate to like, you know, those things weren't around to ride and I didn't see any pros really, you know, riding those things, but like SF was always there in the hills and you could see like that's what he was doing like toad was saying the bump <laughs> you mentioned moving into the house in the city like living in the city for the first time and coming into a house and you're with like all your peers at the same time that's got to be kind of the golden era right like super special to be like oh i'm rooming with strubing and like i'm right here in the heart of the city like probably yeah epic times it was it was absolutely it what happened was i was living in santa rosa and then um and we we're all living in the same place together too but i all of a sudden was just spending all my time in s mm -hmm. kind of like how and so i just ended up moving down there and um and then once you're in the city that can be your whole world like you don't even go out of the city for years sometimes, you know? Yeah, I know. So like I would still go visit Santa Rosa, but it was like, I was just the city, the Bay area, all of that. So who was the crew when you moved into that house? Who, who all lived there? Kid Erickson. 
Yeah. And then uh, Diego was the non-skater. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, it was Jaya and Kit. And then um, I'm not sure exactly when Justin moved in or if he was already there. Actually, I don't even remember that. It all just kind of just all, it all just started. Uh-huh. Blending in. Strubian yeah. said to ask you about some guy that was uh, running from the cops, jumping roof to roof. If you remember oh that. <laughs> yeah, that was nuts, dude. He jumped the gnarliest roof gap. There was abs- absolutely death drop. I mean, you, <laughs> he, if he didn't clear it, he would have died. And um, so I was sitting up there on the roof. And I was like having coffee or something with my girlfriend at the time. And the roof was kind of our kick it spot. And all of a sudden, and there was a lower part of the roof that was the back steps outside the back. So there was like a, a roof over those steps that was lower than the main building. And this dude just pops up and walks over that thing and he's like and i was like what the heck dude like did he just fly here or whatever and uh and he asked if he could use the door and get out of there and i knew that something that this dude was like running from the cops or something and he was definitely no threat to me so i was like heck yeah dude i'll help you with the door let's get you out of here oh man <laughs> so uh <laughs> We let him out of the door, and then it's just SFPD, dude, just rushing the scene. They're asking us where he went, and I was like, I think he went down there. It was, it was gnarly. None of us knew what he did or what happened. That's amazing. The uh, other thing that Strubin mentioned was, I think Toad was a part of this, too. Like, you guys had a two-month tour to Europe. Yes. Talk about that. It sounded like an insane time where it kind of started off like a struggle and maybe a little difficult, but turned into a a real memorable, um, maybe time where you guys all bonded a lot. Yeah. I guess it was like our own little personal hell ride. Like (laughs) forget what we called it, but yeah, we, uh, it did start off struggle and tough. And then I think we just embraced it, dude. And we all like, we were super young, but we grew out as much of our beards as we could. <laughs> and none of us cut our hair. And then the dirty clothes was just like, yeah, man, dirty clothes and just sleeping wherever. And Joe Pino. Dude, Joe Pino. He, went, he was with yeah. you. He was with yeah. us, dude. He fucking yeah. crushed it, dude. He's yeah, so he sick. <laughs> well, why was he with you? He Was he on adrenaline? No, he was on good times. Oh, okay. This is after Left Think. Oh, okay. I don't know how that all happened. I wasn't totally. I got on adrenaline like right after, like right when it, like a month later, it left Think. Okay. So when you were a part of it, it was kind of like on the new era. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when that trip was, though? Yeah, with the new era. Yeah. Uh, Good time skateboards, I think, right? Greg Witt. Oh yeah, yeah. Greg yeah. Witt. Okay, yeah. I, I know Greg. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He hooked up that whole trip. He lined the whole thing up, and like, he was basically like, "All you gotta do is get your plane ticket. We've got the two months all planned out for you." Except for it was pretty, pretty sketchy. But it was you. You guys went to like some summer solstice party, like right out of the gates. <laughs> He's like, uh, we just had, we went, we took a train into Hamburg and then we just put like all our stuff into lockers. And then, like, whoa. I think that was like halfway through the trip or something. Okay. Interesting. And he he was, said, he also said that was the first time maybe anybody of from over here had seen Arto Sari. And he was just like, yeah. dude, I was there. Yeah. I wanted, I was part of the first, dude, in the first photo of Arto in a magazine. He's riding a Hansi Driscoll adrenaline board because I gave it to him. <laughs> I, I walked up to him and I told him, hey, you could have, you could ride for us, man. You could do this. And then I just watched his interview recently and comes to find out that he didn't know anything that I was saying. He didn't saying. know English. Yeah, he didn't no. know any English. No, no he was just, way. 
I was like, dude, <laughs> nodded his head. Like, he was into it, dude. And, uh, if he spoke English, it could have been a different story. <laughs> he was so sick, dude. He was like 16 and he was light years ahead. It was like, we were like, whoa. We were in Denmark, right? Copenhagen at that contest. Yeah. Oh, that was and Copenhagen? We all were just like, we all were just like, who is this golden child? Like, he was a freaking golden child. We were like, oh my God, this guy's fucking incredible. Yes. Right. And it looked like he was learning as he was skating the, the street course. He was like learning tricks as he was. It was insane. It was really weird to watch. Like, And then by and the work. time he got to that last contest and he almost won the last contest, like beat everybody. Like it was just like, holy shit. Holy shit. These contests are... The World Cup, Switzerland, Costin, Willie Santos, <laughs> best skateboarders in the world. Brian and Anderson. Guy <laughs> that shows up. <laughs> this little kid, and he can just everything, dude. And I mean, he was just like all in the biggest pyramid to front board slide down the. Oh, dude, I, I, Joe Pino called me a couple months ago, actually. And he was um, speaking of this trip. There was, we were in uh, this town. Remember Regensburg, Hans? Where we hiked the mountain? No, I think that was, Regensburg was in Germany. And we uh. remember the, um, so he was asking me, he's like, dude, did this really happen? I can't remember. And he was like, he wanted to remember if maybe you can clear it up. And But he said that, um, I mean, I remember part of this. We were like, we were drinking a lot, and I think the, the guy, uh, Medicine Distribution, was taking care of us at the time, and they were like, we were eating dinner with them, and Hansi sees the fish tank, and he's like, dude, we gotta, we gotta set that fish free, and there was like a river, like the, the Rhine River was right outside the door, like, like right there. I think it was the Rhine, I'm pretty sure, but Hansi's like, we gotta let the fish go, we gotta set them free, and like, Hansi... <laughs> <laughs> goes in gets his glass gets the fish and like dude i don't know we were like partying pretty hard i think someone like threw up on the table or something and then like Ponzi grabbed the fish with this other dude this german dude who was like some german ripper kid that like was just a rager kid he was just awesome and like they're getting the fish there's stuff going on over here someone's puking like i don't know what's going on like we like get kicked out of there and then supposedly Hansi lets the fish go. I can't remember because we all split up, I think, at that point because we kind of, like, got out. You know, this is what Joe was asking me. And then supposedly it was in the newspaper the next day. Oh, my God, <laughs> oh. yes. And, like, and Joe's like, do you remember? It was in the newspaper. And I'm like, I don't know. That sounds insane. Oh, sounds uh, about right, like, for that trip. Yeah. But, like. <laughs> I, Strubing was mentioning mushroom tea, so who knows? Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't, know. I don't think I had any mushroom tea, but I tried pot. Yeah, there was so much going on that just crazy shit like that was happening a lot, you know? I, dude, you know, I think Jesse Van Rookout was even with us at that point. She like randomly was on the trip with us for a little bit. Oh, right. I love Jesse. Uh, yeah. She's always cool. She might be able to, <laughs> she might be able to um, concur with that. Let's see, like, I don't remember exactly everything, but Joe, like I totally forgot about it. And Joe was like, Hey, did this really happen? I can't remember. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it was funny. Honestly, I barely remember that. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. That's why I like having these conversations because, um, so many times people have jarred my memory with something that I was like, Holy shit. I forgot all about that. And then like the minute they kind of, put a little pepper on there you're like oh yeah and then you add to it and it's like amazing how your memory can work um, oh and then Hansi made the sick journal on that trip so he, like it was like we didn't none of us had money so we would just like try to raise money to buy a polaroid film for Hans's journal okay <laughs> like, yeah. it was, it was, so it was like, like a whole journal with polaroid pictures yeah and he was just working on it constantly like it was just it was super inspiring to watch and like and we did like something like 28 demos in like 35 days or something. What? It was, yeah, it was kind of crazy. And there, like, was, there wasn't usually dude, a lot of people at the demos either. It was just kind of like we had to do it though. We like Greg Witt had lined it all up and was like, this is what you guys got to do. 
Wow. And then the last four weeks of the trip, we were doing the contest circuit, which was like we had to follow the contests around. And then every weekend was a contest. Mm. Is there a photo of Arto in there, Toad? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. have on the journal because <laughs> there's, there's a bunch of photos of Arto in there. Yes. Damn, that's so cool, uh, man. I got to find it. It's actually not too far from me right now. It's somewhere back in this Thank little back you. zone over here. I'm so stoked you kept it, man. Thank Dude, you. I, <laughs> I got to get it back to you or something. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I think that the, the energy's cleared out for me. For yeah, like the timing's like, good. That, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember this uh, line of Toad skating these hills has become like – it's resurfaced and people have used a lot of it for inspiration. Uh, Toad and I were just out on the streets the other night and one of the GX guys came up and he was like, that line. And Toad's yeah. like, dude, Hans, he filmed it. Yeah. So I, uh, I never knew that. That's fucking hot, dude. Yeah. I've corrected people on Instagram with posts because it gets reposted. And they're like, John Minor filming. <laughs> I was like, no, dude, that's my <laughs> filming. <laughs> <laughs> you yell in the and it's just toad and i and toad had that spot mapped out or at least he, you were looking at it i so looked at it for many years before that yeah, we went like, there for that i never i always thought it was like lame and too snowboardy for people because it was kind of snowboard inspired you know and uh i thought like i never wanted to take mike there anyone because i was like oh they're gonna hate this they're gonna think this is lame and then i was like Maybe Hans will be into filming it. <laughs> How <laughs> we cool. were just we were going out on missions a lot back then too. We would take Jaya's that was Jaya's camera, right? Yeah, there's a good story about that. Um Boat and I had this like epic, maybe it was like a half a year. I don't know, maybe it was a whole year, but there was like this chapter of SF where Jaya was transferring over to photography. And the new three chip cam camera that was just the baby and taken everywhere, all of a sudden was being just sitting there over in the corner, fully charged. And so uh -huh. Toad and I were, there's a chapter of time when Toad and I were just out there filming and we were filming everything like Toad just said. So we were like getting like, like there was like, there just be articles. Like uh, there was a, there was a power line pole. They were put, up on hate street so we just stopped and skated that and i got kickflip power line pole ride and Toad dropped in on it and slammed really hard because his front wheels peeled off the wrong way and he fell back backside on that baby <laughs> and we started skating like getting real creative because uh like toad said it wasn't the it wasn't the video um shoot it wasn't like a video shoot it wasn't like the thing that you were thinking about getting it was like this pressure i want to go get the big gap or the the do to do or the big poly we're just out there skating and yeah you were documenting your day more so than like we got to get this gnarly trick it was just like if that happens yeah. it's going to happen organically <clears throat> but we're yeah. just going out to skate today and we want to film our day yes yeah, it was more like that i think remember hans we were I don't know if it was, I think you were too, but we were inspired by the Avenue video because a lot of oh, people were just skating tricks. And like, I was like, Dude, let's, I like to just skate random shit, you know, like, and roll. Actually, rolling is like a big part of skateboarding that like was overlooked at the time and uh -huh. sliding and stuff. And remember the Avenue video, Hans? Dude, Joe, Joe and Sean and Adrenaline, we had this like, we both loved each other. So like we'd see Sean go and they'd be like, what up? And we'd be like, what up? And we both affected each other's camps so a ton. And we'd like stop and talk and vibe out and stuff. And then uh, they'd get some crazy weird shit. And then we would be like, I'm going to get some weird ass shit around yeah. the city. It's uh, original. Maybe made me feel like it was okay to like the my thinking was like validated at that point because it 
it wasn't usually i mean the, the trick the ledge and the trick and the gap were like uh-huh. what was going on it wasn't like free flowing you know and so it yeah. was like i don't know it inspired me to like be like oh i'm not so crazy <laughs> you know <laughs> really cool it's really cool that uh it's standing at the test of time and it's like Joe Valdez like went down in history. Like when it was going down, it was just, we thought it was just some freaky small time. We didn't, you know, it wasn't like Danny way or day one. It wasn't like what was going down in the plan B videos and this, that we thought we were just kind of doing some kind of like crazy wacky stuff on the side, but it lo and behold skating loves it forever. It's really cool. Yeah. Have you seen like the dime contest and, and how much love they give to Joe Valdez up in the Canada yeah. thing? That's too cool. awesome. They love that dude. Like yeah. they, they had him come out like a wrestler, like it's Joe Valdez. <laughs> and everyone's like, ah, <laughs> oh, no way. Yeah. That's it's a- fucking amazing. Um, what other, like what he other stuff? It were you a part of that you were maybe there for or that you filmed like toad and i were talking about there's so much shit that jaya did that was insane like the nose slide i think it's either washington or sacramento street like on a hill that he did the whole fucking thing and nobody's really come to that since like it's it's so early to this day but like were you were you there for that were you there for some other things that stand out to you that are like oh wait hold on this this thing was insane definitely that uh the golden gate bridge that mike talked about in your interview Mm. i was the only other guy there so i was on the golden gate bridge jaya experience wow yeah that was wild and also when you said earlier about how if we knew that our skate group was different um one of the first things that happened when i that made me realize that this is uh that we are maybe a little bit different i was there when cardiel i drove down from Lake of the Pines, Grass Valley, with, with Cardiel to when he late back so and aided the Gons. I was Whoa. there. Wow. And, and yeah, and uh, when Henry ran up, Henry was my hero. I had the first Henry board, dude. I just loved dude, that that real ad of him doing the nose pick tail grab at night mm. down the trail. I'll do that. was just like, just my, that's my heart. I love Henry. And so when Henry ran up to John and gave him a high five after the back, so an 80, I was like, wait, wait, what? I was <laughs> like, and then I was looking at John and I was like, yeah, holy, yeah, John is different. He is like, it was like this moment of like, whoa, dude, okay. Yeah. Cardiel is Cardiel. like it, it's not just our homie and just we you know we just all know him he's like special special very special he's the best I mean so much shit for a guy that didn't I mean did he ever live in San Francisco he I don't think so did he it was more of like a drive down and get yeah, it yeah because but they got Cardiel gap Cardiel ledge like you seen what he did at Miley like John put a stamp on that early on on some stuff that's like, you know, undeniable. And then it's like getting, yeah. I think he was the third person to get skater of the year. I think it went Tony Hawk, Danny way. And then John, I was there for the gone's backwards too. I'm in the picture. Wow. I'm in, yeah. I mean, if you look at the picture and big brother of him, just stretched out all in it, I'm in the bottom holding the flash. Tobin had me hold the flash in the photo and the flash didn't go off. <laughs> so I'm just holding this flash. And uh, for what photo that, was that? The gone's backwards. Oh, John did it too, right? John did it. And then uh, Scott Bourne almost died trying it. Oh, what did, was there ever footage of John doing that? Cause I always wondered what happened no, what, before this is really long time ago so it was just like Tobin was uh get the camera out and get it you know 
Because I just listened to a Tobin interview and he talks about it. And he didn't give much like insight to it. And I was like, I don't know, you were there. So that's like, did he land and just ollie off and landed afterwards? He pulled it. So it's such a big gap that he landed full compression, you know, not just like landing and ollie. He yeah. like landed, squatted and cardioed out, dude, full squats, yeah. stretched it so far, landed full squat. And then as he rolled off the edge, because you can't go forward, you'll just die or run into it. Draw yeah, you run into the other with a wall. Yeah. So you have to land and go off the side. And so he's full squat as he's coming off because he couldn't lift up to come off. He was just rolling off full squat. His uh, kingpin caught and he got pitched and somehow he cardio rolled or just freaking somehow he survived it. But he ollied the <laughs> <laughs> And I remember when Scott Bourne ollied it, um, I was actually like angry at Scott because uh, I wasn't angry at Scott. I was angry that someone else that someone thought that they could this, do something that John could do that thinking that things John can do are just hard to do. Like I was like, I love Scott and I was friends with him at the time, but I was upset that he thought he could do something that John could like only do basically like I, in my mind like john skating wasn't something that you just tried with him and stuff something uh, in, in my what i'm getting at was that was john dude you didn't want to try and all eat the guns backwards with him dude i was down there with the flash i was like clearly like this like john is like superhuman capabilities dude he was trying so, at the same day with him no john uh scott tried it later and he literally almost died. Footage of it. Was John in Big Brother? Was there a photo of it? Yeah, he was. Uh, he got an interview in one of the early Big Brothers, and uh, Tobin helped with that. And John took me for the ride um, that, for that. Is that the one where he kind of talks shit on snowboarding? It's pretty kind of loose interview. That I think they. It was like in sections, and it seemed kind of like an entertainment piece and it kind of like how big brother was kind of going for that like right. kind of it was just so it's like yeah shock value shock value yeah oh man dude were you at the session there was a session that I, I was just watching the video footage the other day it's like uh jamie thomas is there gone i think it was when gone's kick flipped it and and Jehovah's trying a 360 ollie over it <clears throat> And like, there's, it's a huge session, tons of people down there. Was Drahobo and Pales and them living uh, on that street when you were there? Yeah, yeah I loved that. Yeah. It was like, who was it? Was uh, O'Brien? Was O'Brien? O'Brien and Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, Greg, War Greg War yeah. yeah. Dude, so sick. Um, do you want to talk at all about like the kit stuff and like, I don't know. I always talk about our fallen bros, like Phil, Kit, Jaya. There's so many dudes that um, we lost too early and how that kind of impacted you. Definitely. I've been thinking about it a lot recently because, uh, I mean, you know, being older and stuff and hindsight and all that, um, it was so rough to, like, keep to act like – we're still just fired up and keep going, you know, it was like Strubing and Jai were on this house and it was just like kicking ass and we were just getting stuff. And then one of your homies dies and right. it was like, keep going. And looking back on it, if I could do it again, or if I could uh, give advice to young, young people, younger skaters that go through it, um, I, what I would do now is I would, uh, have a morning session. Mm. Like I'd let it let it all out. Like in the morning, like wake up and go, this fucking sucks. Mm. This is fucked up. This is 
fucking dude my heart's hurt dude i'm fucking bummed dude i'm mm. bummed out of my mind i don't even know what to do and like literally have these like moments where we all look at each other and hug and cry and fucking punch the wall or whatever dude and then let's go get some for kit you know like mm. like do that type of thing but we were just like just keep trucking and like but it was like this cloud that just was like funky dude so if like i could do it if i could do it could have done it different i would have done it like that like express. get some of it out of you yes yeah i remember when phil yeah, died totally. like when phil died it was basically my doorway to thrasher like jake came out and he was like hey you're gonna because i was working for think and he was like you're gonna work for thrasher now and i was just like kind of scared of Jake at that time. And I was just like, uh, like I had it good with think, but then like, yeah, it's kind of what you said. Like, it's like, I don't know if compartmentalize is the right word, but you kind of, I mean, you're grieving forever, but like, you don't like, even recently when Pre Preston died, I didn't cry. I didn't like go, wow, you know? And I don't think there's any advice I can give anyone. Cause I think everyone does it differently but i do think that it is important to try to get it out like some way or the other for sure yes did you guys do like video after that yes yeah our, our like industry section and we can for 411 yeah uh-huh yeah. and there was a rail this gnarly rail that uh with a death drop on one side it was a flat rail off this loading dock with a death drop on one side that kit got one day there's a car in the way and he got on it and uh but there's a car in the way and then he passed away literally like right after that and that was something that i went and got for him oh see that's sick yes yeah and i just i was trying to process it uh, you're, you got that, um, thing where people are like, you know, buck up thing. I think, uh, just our culture is more mature these days. Like people are able to like talk about things instead of like the tougher nineties and like, just like, don't cry pussy or something, you know, like, yeah, now it's okay. like tough and cry when shit goes bad. Like your fucking friend dies. Like, dude, yes, this is the moment to fucking cry. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely i remember i even hugged wade i for some reason this sticks out so much was that out palo alto or? that was in road city like right up the street from where phil's mom lived oh, okay it was like some church i i was pretty sure you were there right i don't know i don't think i was there i think i was at the greer if there was a thing at career uh-huh yep dude and then strubin's younger brother died right that's and I was like within the same time, so it was freaking hard. It was rough. Dude. That was a rough little chapter. I know. Justin's been through some stuff too. It's like, it's interesting because you look at yourself yeah. and then you look at your friends and you're like, oh man, everybody's going through their version of he like these horrible incidents that just pile up. And yes. I, I think like for yourself, you know, you were always into like classic example where you're on the trip and you don't have a lot of money. So you get the fucking Polaroid in your document. Like that is a huge part of why skateboarders are lucky and fortunate because we always were documenting us not for this purpose, but it, it, it serves this purpose. Like we have a lot of footage and photos of our friends because of what we do. Yes. So, I, you know, it's tough. You always look at, try to look at the silver lining. How, how early, like, did you get into jewelry school? Was that in the city or is that a little bit later? Like Jason Lee said the other week on the Nines Club interview, that uh, skating had this small window back then. I mean, dude, it was just like he was, you know, you're 26, dude. Whew, you're done, dude. Fucking, yeah. You know, that was cool that you had a check. It was gnarly, dude. And I'm so proud of skating for being more mature about, like, 
whatever. Skating's so much more mature now. I love sk- skating's more fun now than it's ever been, I think, personally. Um, but yeah, I just was feeling that like small window energy and um, was like, screw it, I'm just going to go do something else. And I always loved uh, crystals. Like there's lots of uh, quartz crystals up here as a mm-hmm. kid. And when I would find those crystals as a kid, I would just <clears throat> out, dude. I would just like so fascinated. And I just lug go back to the mine the next day and just dig there for hours and just had my, then put them up on certain spots. And like, I would like tie string to them and make a necklace out of them. <laughs> and so um, I was into gems. And then I started cutting gems and uh, that's done with the faceter where you got a crystal and then you cut it into a gem with the, with the points on it. Yeah. And after that, my family in humble was, uh, took the executive decision on me to like push me to like actually go for it. Oh, Cause I was up there and I was, I was after skating and I clearly didn't give a shit about making money or like trying to make it with making money as a goal. Cause I was around a lot of money and I just was like still doing art and stuff. Mm. And uh, so they sent me to the Revere Academy in the Phelan building in downtown SF, that building in SF that's on the corner that's really narrow and tall. Yeah. And uh, I was in there and I thought I was taking some type of local NorCal class. Well, there was people from all over the world in this class. There was a woman from Argentina. There was people from Canada. There was people from Montana, the New England, everywhere. And they saved up years to go to this jewelry academy. And I was just like, my family just threw me in there. And I was just from NorCal. So I was like, holy shit, I'm in a professional, serious career type situation. And so I got really stoked. And then um, right from the start, they had the biggest jewelers teach the classes at that Revere Academy. And so there's like the gnarliest jewelers that live in SF are just incredibly successful. And so they they would teach the classes and do like things and bring in jewelry. And uh, there was a few times where I was in there and they would have us do an assignment and like 80% of the class is just trying to like, just trying to wield the metal into like 90 degrees and do the things. And I could just do it. And like, uh, the instructor one day was so stoked on these earrings that she put them on and I'll never forget it. Cause, uh, She's super famous, Rhonda Coriel. I mean, she is like this famous jeweler designer, won all these awards, makes these incredibly expensive stuff, has all these contracts with businesses, sponsored, just like skating. And um, she's like, look how it looks. And she put it on her ear. And I was like, whoa, I was like tripping, like, okay, like my hand eye coordination with it is uh, works or whatever, you know? Nice. And it's really cool. Um, it's, uh, got a touch of skating in that, um, the people that are actually doing it, it's a really small group. Now, like the people that are actual jewelers and jewelry designing are a small group compared to like the industry of jewelry stores is just washed out. And that's just the job for people. And they're just showing up to work and next year they could work at a freaking wherever, you know, but uh, mm. the designers are the people in there getting their hands dirty and sitting at the bench. When I moved to Maine, I entered the state competition and I uh, got second in the state. And, and so, um, and that was like just years after coming out of class. And I was working at the biggest jewelry store in Maine. Wow. I just 
and Emily got a job there. It was cool. It was really cool. Huh. How did you like Maine? Was Maine uh, similar in any way to like uh, gold country or like? Yeah. Cool. It was just like Grass Valley, really, except for the winters. <laughs> you yeah. got to be raised in that environment to be able to be used to having those long shifts of not being able to skate and stuff. And uh, right when I moved there, um, Dan Hatch opened a skate shop, and there was this little skate park that was all masonite and wood stuff. Mm. Perfect mini ramp. I mean, the most absolutely perfect mini ramp. So, started skating. I filmed a little video of those guys. Yeah, and uh, that'll be cool to go through. I have it on my uh, little tapes. I ate or something. Sick. Does something stick out to you that like you've traveled and 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 went to this place that like sticks out as this like just rad spot that you got to skate? You remember Tango World? No. It was, I think it was called Chango World. It was like in Chicago or somewhere. It was like in a mall and it was like a BMX track of, of wood and ramps. And I hey. thought you were on that trip with Think Adrenaline. I think they yeah. went there. Like Phil has footage just going around this whole thing. And you just, it was like you were hitting burnt like jumps and keep going. And oh, it, cool. I never went there and I always was like, man, that looks so sick. But uh. like, is there a spot that sticks out to you in your recollection of spots? Um, I guess I was just so in love with the uh, East Coast skaters and Matt Reason mm. so of Park. Dude, when I went on one of those trips, uh, we had a week of no demos, and Greg Carroll gave us the option. Um, you can stay in Philadelphia or you can go, everyone wanted to go to New York. Pete BC was with us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so everyone's like, New York, New York. Well, Pales and Matt Reason were friends. Uh, Matt Pales and I broke off from the tour van, and we stayed with Matt Reason. Rad. Awesome. We stayed at Matt Reason's house, and um, that was some of the – that was – honestly some of the best memories i have because uh those guys are so hardcore and how they just all skate from here to the next spot you know is they want to take buses and shit like sf yeah and i remember one day i mean we went to so many spots and i was skating with so many people that i just were absolute my heroes i mean those east coast dudes are just soldier skaters and they just skated raw and fast and yeah fast. Oh, and uh, we were at this spot after skating who knows how many hours, literally seven or something, just all day long skating for seven hours. And they took us to this high ollie spot that was in the video. So I was like, oh, shit, dude, that's the high ollie spot. And fucking, <laughs> I got it and my body, I ollied it. But when I landed, my legs were burning so bad that I couldn't even push myself back up and stand up and i landed in a squat and just <laughs> squatted and just kind of fell down and then i just like rolled over to the curb and sat there and i was like holy fuck i'm tired dude my legs were done i couldn't skate anymore i was just like so stoked it was it was awesome yes was awesome. yeah i've heard um similar stories where people went back to skate like robbie and jimmy and them too like where it's just like dude these dudes push hella hard the whole <laughs> time and and they don't take buses they just go spot to spot and dude the streets aren't that smooth out there yes. <laughs> you know so yeah. it's like I remember when dan pencil moved out he moved and lived in sf for a little bit and he used to always be like, ah, your spots are so fucking skate park. Everything's smooth out here. All the shit's rough back where we live. It's like, yeah, it's fucking cool. Well, what, what sparked the resurgence? Because if anybody's following you on Instagram, you're fucking ripping again and skating the, are you in Grass Valley? You're at the Grass Valley yeah. Park. Yeah. What happened? Did some, anything in particular, like be like, you just saw your board one day and we're like, I'm like, well, what happened? 
Well, thank you for that compliment. Honestly, that means a lot to me. It really Dude, does. It's super cool to see you ripping. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know how it really happened, but somehow I think maybe you were watching or listening to a podcast and you reached out to me and then I saw your thing and started following you. And I was like talking to Toad about it. And pretty soon I'm like, holy shit, dude, the guy's like, you got a lot of clips, like in a short period of time, like you're ripping. Well, thank you. Uh, I uh, spent so much of my life running away Mm. and trying to like be someone else, be a jeweler and just be like, uh, and that involves heavy drinking, (laughs) honestly. And uh, when the big jewelry shop I worked at went out of business, I was already starting to do gold country and I always skated on the side. We would like skate in between our hangovers or go to the park with drinks. Uh And uh, so at the skate, so the big jewelry shop went out of business friend that I love, this girl moved away and I was kind of just in this low point. And then I just quit drinking. It it all bottled up. Uh, Everything bottled up was released and I was focusing. I was able to process things. I was like, dude, I'm bummed that I wasted so much of my youth that I would never get back. Mm -hmm. I just, and so I decided to get as much in as I can at whatever age. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but it really is something to like clear out the regrets and to come to peace with my spirit, to heal the sadness of letting myself down about just running away and not being like a, uh, involved in it anymore and uh and i got good lots of good friends my older friends that are skating and they're stoked uh, my friend gabe copeland like i brought up earlier he's on the same path he's like just super stoked to skate and get in what he can because of the years wasted like uh all the good times wasted having good times like that song on that country yeah. song. <laughs> the animals what up with gold country talk, talk yeah. about gold country yeah. dude that was like a yeah. that's an amazing really movement that was a movement up yeah there. really fun i was making money from all these different directions i was like supposedly probably the most successful i've ever been i was like making money at my big jewelry job i was working at this multi-million dollar huge jewelry job man and i was had my own personal jewelry in multiple stores in town and I was making money other ways with the gardening in Grass Valley. <laughs> Toad's wedding ring. <laughs> My wedding ring, dog. It's a Hanzi. It's a Hanuman special right there, dude. Sick. I love it. I back it all the way. Anyone needs jewelry made, wedding bands, anything, Hanzi's got you covered, dude. Yeah. Killed it. Crushed it. <laughs> made it exactly how I wanted it, too. It was amazing. Yeah. So what exactly was gold, is gold country? Is it, it's more of like a lifestyle of all that stuff combined or? Uh, well, no, I just wanted, I just, uh, when I woke up, so to speak, just was looking around and all my friends are involved in skating. And I was like, I do something too. But the thing was that I was making so much money from the side that it, I was just playing. I was just having the time of my life. I formed a skate team best skaters in town and uh, i was giving everyone boards i didn't even care about sales at all but i was kind of like acting like i was gonna do a company but really honestly i knew in my subconscious that i was out of touch from skating for so long that i didn't really know what i was doing if i was gonna try and do it and then i realized that everyone has skate companies now it's not like the old days where it was rare and you could just start something small and kind of take off. So it turned into more of like a, just a fun art project for our friends. And uh, it was amazing. Eddie Marino, Ty Bancroft, Bob Hawking, uh, Max Driscoll, Ian Fogel, Matt Hurani, and then Kane Jerome 
was the Grom. And Kane was this little helmet kid that was just shredding. And um, my friends even told me recently, they, they admitted to me, they were like, dude, we didn't know what you were doing. We used to laugh. We were like, why is Kane on gold country? And why is Hans putting him on the team? Well, Kane is killing it now. Ah, and, he rips. Yeah, and that's what Will Fairchild said. He's like, dude, you knew that he wasn't just the Grom. He, you, they were like, dude, Hans, you're the one that spotted the talent early on. And uh, and we had the time of our lives. And it was really awesome. When you live in small towns, there's ebb and flow. So there'll be like five years where a bunch of group of the homies move out of town or they're like working or like they all have kids or something. And then like, it's all up to a few groups of people. So you really have to go with it. And that was this time in Grass Valley when everyone, everything came together. Okay. We just and it was on fire. You could go to the park and it was just going down, dude. It's a fun park. Yeah. And so it was like, it just happened to be at this time when I did the company that there was like a lot of rippers in town. And so it just, it worked. It was really, really a good time. Rad. Do you, are you in touch at all? Do you know that guy, George, um, that does Iris? No, I don't. Okay, he moved up there, I think, like within a year, and he's got a little bowl going and stuff, and he does Whoa. all the, he makes all the uh, stuff out of like old uh, skateboards, like wood and stuff and whatnot. But uh, yeah, dude, and then Gus is Gus still up there? Yeah, yeah, Gus is still up there here. I see him all the time. Uh huh. Gus is one of my old longest skate friends. Gus and I were friends before middle school, so we were friends in like fourth or fifth grade wow i'm claiming fourth grade because i remember them i was in fifth grade and i remember being in pe and we were like we played against them and like <laughs> him and gus were friends already and they already dressed like skaters i was i was like bmx kid uh -huh. and like they, i remember seeing them they were we were playing like dodgeball or something like that you wouldn't remember the songs i don't know why i remember it i have like a weird memory like that but and you guys were like homies and our classroom was against your classroom or something weird. And like, uh, um, it was like fifth graders against fourth graders. But um, Hans and Gus were like best friends for years. Back right. then. Yeah, man. I, uh, I loved run DMC, dude. I really like tacos. This is, <laughs> this is like when hip, there wasn't like the rappers and the rockers. There was no hip hop genre yet at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, there, was, there was rockers, but not really hip hop. Dudes. I loved my run DMC shirt. And when I wore it to school and got made fun of, I was so hurt, dude. I was a little kid. But I was hurt, dude. I was like, dude, I loved Run DMC. I didn't, dude, I couldn't get it, dude. I was just yeah. like, huh. oh, man. And then Gus had a Run DMC shirt, too. And he was <laughs> like, dude, I love it. Like, he's like, dude, I love them, too. Like, you know, like, I was just, sick. yeah, that was like when I was like, fell in love with him. I was like, dude, yes, dude. He's my brother, dude. Oh, man. <laughs> that rules. Yeah, I saw Run DMC. They're uh, who was it? It was Public Enemy and uh, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince opened <laughs> for them, and when and Jazzy Je Jeff and the Fresh Prince, whatever they were called, they came out and somebody threw a, like a a bomb on the stage, like a firework or some M eighty or something, and everyone fucking ran off. And then Public Enemy and Run DMC had to play the whole set with the lights on. Wow! But you got yeah. to see Public Enemy too. Yeah, they play. It was like uh, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, then Public Enemy. Yeah, it was early, dude. It was like the first Public Enemy album. I think Run DMC maybe was two albums in or something. But like that, like you said, and then like Beastie Boys come out and like slowly there's like these things, LL Cool J, and there's different things. But Run DMC for some reason kind of back then seemed a little more street and edgy. But later you start seeing Wu-Tang and like other dudes that you're like, Oh, run DMC is a little more mainstream. But in the beginning they were fucking the shit for sure. Yeah. They were badass, dude. Yeah. They were like tough, you know, they had that tough, mm. solid 
Canadian style. Yeah. My first show my parents had to take me to, because I was a little tiny kid, um, Run DMC came to Sacramento at the Arco Arena, and there was a group opening up for them, and their name was the Beastie Boys. Oh. And I didn't know. And this is when they had girls in cages with <laughs> yeah. ears and smashing them and running around and screaming. And like I said, the girls in the cages. And I was just like, my jaw dropped. I was just like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> awesome. I was just like freaking out, dude. I was like, what? I was almost like girls at the Beatles show or something. I wasn't screaming. <laughs> and crying but i was just like <laughs> of the bc boys and then i went and got licensed to ill the tape yeah and like ever since then it was just like dude the heavy BC rotation <laughs> yeah. i remember going to hansi's house and it was like like a lot of public enemy going on um even some uh living color i remember you had a living color, yeah. living color tape <laughs> No, uh, dude, they were sick, dude. Yeah, I look, I like listen to them sometimes. I'm like, damn, they were actually really good. Uh -huh. Not as good as Bad Brains, but I don't know. I remember Hans introduced me to some music that I liked a lot. I ended up liking a lot. Terminator Exit. <laughs> I think uh, Tommy had a Public Enemy shirt or something, and, and like, that helped and, and he was that. really into De La Soul too. I think, and like anything he was doing, we were just like, oh, we got to fucking check this out. Yeah. I think that's how you figured Dude. shit out was the mag a lot back then, right? You'd see a photo and you'd be like, what's that? And you'd do research. It's, it's like there's no social media or any fucking shit like today. But uh, yeah, it was cool too because we were a small group. And, and so it felt more like if you're doing it, it's probably cool because we're all in the same group. It wasn't so like everyone's a skater. It was like more like our little club or something. Yeah. I remember going to the Adrenaline House, and then Hansi got Tommy's first tape. I think Loose Grooves and Black Bastard Blues or oh. something like that. Is that the first one? Yeah. Dude, wore wow. the shit out of that. I couldn't get enough. I'd, I'd be like, I'm coming over, Hans. I got to listen to that tape again. We got yeah. to hear that shit. <laughs> Dude, it's Tommy, Tommy's first tape was killing it. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they're all really good. But, like, I just remember. They're really, I, huh? I'd be like, Hansi, I'm coming over. We got to listen yeah. to that tape <laughs> <That's sick. laughs> and then go skate. <laughs> well, is there anything on the horizon? You got anything that you're working on or like uh, trips coming up or anything? Um, I have uh, been talking with uh, my Southern California friends about trying to go down there more next year instead right. of like the year and try and get in on that scene down there. It's just kicking ass. The skate scene is just uh really awesome you know my friend lives near the park where day one always goes huh. and he sends me sniper shots of him filming day one from the side <laughs> like so freaking jealous dude i love day one so much man he is one of my all-time favorites especially because his age you know he's and, so remarkable like he yeah. i mean that stuff did you ever see the stuff where he's like on a mini ramp and he like i think he does a flip trick and the wheel comes off and he grab like sh he's doing stuff that's like wait what he's having fun yeah he's having fun they want amazing he's, he's humble too which is just i don't know humility always gets me i'm like i love it when people are humble oh, like that, they're that good and you're just like and you can just talk to them like it's cool yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, for wow. sure Hey, do you talk to Strubin or Sen or Minor or Manzuri, any of the old dudes? Yeah, I just talked to Mike Manzuri on the phone just a few days ago, and that was cool. Mike, but awesome. uh, it kind of like uh, supernova at that time when adrenaline was falling apart, and uh -huh. uh, it's such an emotional topic for me that I just couldn't even process it, dude. I just needed to run and run as fast as I could, dude, to, to uh -huh. like hide from myself because I just had so many feelings about it. And so I uh, really haven't connect. For, I spent a lot of time not connecting with those guys. Mm. And so I'm trying to like, trying to make up for lost time. 
But as far as Toad and I, Toad and I have stayed close. <laughs> that rules. I remember when you left though, when you I was I was super bummed because like I I think it was like ninety nine or somewhere around there, you went to Maine. And then yeah. it was like there was a long period where we didn't hang and I was like I like my whole crew disbanded and fell apart. And then I was like trying to find my spot again, my my homies again. It was kind of rough. Sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, it was all good. I'm sure you didn't want to. Like it was just like like you're saying, you're going through some shit. You had to figure it out. Like I wasn't helping you figure it out. So it was like, fuck, you gotta go figure it out. Like check it out, Toad. I was uh my girlfriend at the time needed me- medication for like her te- she just got dental work so we were going and filling her prescription at the local walgreens or something like that and mm-hmm. i was just like completely trying to like just start over i don't know what i was doing but i was like trying to like be a different person or something and i saw and i was like bored and I just was like becoming really despondent almost like my soul was dislocated dude I was like my spirit not inside me anymore and so I was like couldn't like deal with standing with her in line or socializing at all so I just walked over to the magazine rack and I walked over and Cardiel was on the cover of trans world and I was like whoa and I picked it up and I just stared at it and I was like, John's still skateboarding? Oh, man. It was just like, honestly, I was just like, what's my life doing? I was like, dude, I want to go skateboarding, dude. I want to oh, go skateboarding. Man. John was doing the nose blunt down that handrail on the cover of like skateboarder or something. Maybe it was trans. <laughs> it was yeah. a nose red shirt or something. Yeah. Uh, that's when my life like the cracks in the seams started busting on my like, like running away trip and and running from my own trip. That's when it was like, dude, I want to go skate. This isn't my, this isn't actually who I am. This uh, nine to five square at this jewelry shop where I'm just going to work there for the rest of my life and not be around skaters, not being around skaters is rough. If you ever go through, of time where you're just around the working class, the civilian civilians instead oh, yeah. of the state army, dude. You, yeah. you you don't have someone to vibe out with and laugh and fucking let it loose and be who you are and be like funky or just whatever. Like you know, skating's accepting for who like letting the wild side of life. You know, yeah. so yeah, agree. Uh, was this in was this in Maine? Yeah, and that's okay. when it started started cracking apart and I started being like, dude, I can't do this. And the girlfriend at the time's like, uh, this is just life. Cause she was like from a working class uh, family and I was raised by hippies. They never really went and worked for anyone else. We kind of grew our own vegetables and lived more free. Like I never really saw my dad's like worry about losing a job. <laughs> my dad's, you know, they lived, they worked for themselves and stuff. And that's when I moved back and then um, moved back to SF. And I tried to keep going with that culture of working. And I was working two big jewelry jobs in SF. I was working for two designers and I, uh, one, uh, Amy Faust in the Mission area. And then Thea Izzy in Oakland and I was just trying to keep trucking with that and then um, my friend Rich Shepardson came to visit and he told me about Cardiel's accident and then that's when that's when it broke dude that's when I was like fuck this dude I'm gonna go skateboarding dude I, I, I can come back and work do these jobs later at any given time when I'm old, but I want to go skate now, dude. I want to like skate and live life. And I had this like falling down moment, like the movie falling down where he just snaps in traffic. (gasps) Dude, this Muni, this bus didn't show up. Oh no. I was just stressed out as can be, dude. Just barely making ends meet in the city. 
I was running up to catch the bus after coming from the BART underneath the bay uh, from the Oakland job. And the bus pulled away right as I was running up. And I just came on glued, dude. And I smashed my <laughs> skateboard into to just splinters, dude. And I just kept smashing it on the curb and like people cleared out around me. And I smashed that skateboard into oblivion, dude. It was just like, I had no idea how stressed and angry and just bummed I was on uh, not doing what I love anymore. And I went and I walked to Golden Gate Park and I bought this little flask of vodka and I fucking drank that whole thing. And there's this pond with these goose geese. And I sat there and it, I'll never forget that moment, dude. I was like, dude, I can't, I can't do this with this girl. I can't do this working class shit, dude. I'm not who I'm acting like. This isn't me, dude. I can't do this at all. And, uh, we broke up soon after I moved out of the city. I moved back up here and I started hanging out with all my old skate friends back up here in, in town and got freedom back in my life and uh, was still kind of like uh, off the rails because of the gardening life up here. You don't really have to answer to anyone and you were making a lot of money making up your own hours. You don't have to answer to anyone. So uh, you could really go off the rails with alcohol. They always say the first one's free, but watch out for the next million. Eventually I snapped out of it. Thank God. Was started skating again, reconnecting with code and skateboarding's really reconnected me back with everyone, you know? Yeah, dude. Classic story of skateboarding saves like a lot and it helps so much. You know what I mean? Like for everything, for like, Pleasure and pain, right? It's like for grieving or for like provoking the stoke. I need to just get out and fucking do something. It's like skateboard right out the door. You don't have to go wait for a chairlift. You don't have to wait for good wave report. You don't have to do anything. You just put the board down and roll. And that's yeah. what's always been so rad about skateboarding is like you don't have an excuse not to do it, except for you don't, you're not going to do it. Little Timmy might go in there and drown. Even if it's raining, you can go to a parking garage and go yeah. fucking roll around, you know, at least. So, dude, I, I just like your energy, like that you've been like, I don't know, it feels really positive and good. Like where your headspace is at right now. I really, I, I'm really into it. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Mm. Um, one thing before I forget um, that we could throw in the edit was uh, one of those think adrenaline trips for two months with Phil. There were yeah. some cool moments. Like uh, we went to a skate ramp. It was like towards the end of it, St. Louis. And the guy had one of those old 70s clear half pipes with the rib structure, the squares. Yeah, like the Pepsi ones. Sucked. Dude, this <laughs> thing sucked, dude. Oh, that was the worst thing I'd ever seen in my whole life. Now, if we would have came across this demo in the first few weeks, we would have all been like, fuck yeah, it is skating up. But like, we showed up there and we were like, lame, man. Fucking, like, didn't even give it a go. But like, Phil understood the role. He was so mature that he understood why we're on this trip, why they're paying, why I think it's paying for all our meals, every hotel, why the whole thing's going. So Phil got out there and, uh, the dude had an old fucking skateboard with like nose guard and fucking big fat wide wheels and shit. And Phil grabbed that board and shredded that vert ramp on that board. And like, I'll never forget that. Cause I was like, all of us were like, how's he having fun? And he was just like having so much fun. He's like, it was so lame that like he just turned it all around to be like, like make it awesome and fun and like it was like such a cool memory and then like towards the end of it frustrations got high and it was just like tension and this that you have all the different types of humans in the van and uh phil and i just glitched out 
and started ripping the stuffing out of the pillows that we stuffed from the hotels, <laughs> started stuffing it in our coats and made ourselves all like fat Santa and like this fake hair. And we're started like, we're like glitched out and we're like, happy van, happy van, happy van. And we started doing all this shit and it's in the end of the think video. Phil and I are at the end of the video and we're like laughing like kids. Like, I guess we were kids, but we were like, where the tensions get so high to where people are either going to like start fist fighting. <laughs> or it, they're just going to, we're just going to start just like glitching, having fun, dude. And uh, so that's what we did. We were like, took it like super fun. Happy van, dude. <laughs> happy <I> van. <laughs> was it a happy van? It was like rest of the that's moment. Amazing. You could cut the air with the knife. Yeah. And then, Talking with Toad earlier, I was in the van when uh, Nick Trache got kicked off. Oh. I was I was in the van. Whoa! Yeah, it was tough, dude. It was scary. Honestly, is the right word. What and, happened? Um, well, to, to start it off for people that don't know, um, Nick and Greg are longtime childhood friends, so yeah. it was like a team rider getting kicked off. They were homies, dude. They were like, they've already been through everything together. So um, they got into it and they were, it wasn't like, uh, like Pales or me and Greg, like how we just are so thankful to be sponsored and just look up to Greg with all our heart because he's this new person in our life. And uh, it was more like longtime friends that just got into it. And um, I was laughing with Toad earlier because uh, at the moment it was like, oh, my God, Nick's done, dude. It's over. It's over forever. And then lo and behold, Nick and Diamond. And Nick turns out to be one of the most successful guys out of that whole van. Yep. He and on to be amazing. And who knows who knows if like hard times make tough men or whatever they say. So like maybe um, that going through that made Nick want to really kick ass mm. and do something awesome instead of like an easy road where it just keeps trucking. Who knows? I don't know. I just the thought that I went through, but you never know who's going to be getting where and doing what it's like, damn, that shit blew up. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm super proud of them, and I'm super, uh, super stoked that happened. I sent him a message talking about that. I was like, dude, I was there. I remember that shit. Seemed wow. like end of the road, but lo and behold, it was just the beginning. Yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm guessing we'll see each other soon. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to be part of the uh, Old Dogs, Old Tricks curb skating video. Yeah. That looks I'm gonna put uh, I'm gonna put it all together here soon. So um, we're gonna put like I just get people to send me the clips and stuff, and then uh, cool. it's it's been fun doing those. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank. Yes, I'd love to visit. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. And skater year is that coming up or is that already? It happened? just was last week. Yeah, Miles Miles Silva, and yeah. it was uh, the party was what was it Friday? Yeah, Friday. Okay. Well, yep. You got anything that, else you want to throw in there, Toad? I think that that's schmitting. <laughs> Were you in the car that one time? Well, we hitchhiked back from Grass Valley one time. And this is random. I don't even know if you should throw this in there, but we were hitchhiking back. I think it was you and John and I. And the two dudes that picked us up, they were kind of sketchy. And I think they were, they were like shooting up heroin in the front seat while we were that while they're driving us down 49, which is a fucking super dangerous highway. A lot of people, friends we've known have died on it and stuff. And, and these dudes were like shooting up. They were like helping each other. And like, we were just in the backseat. All what are that? We were probably like in eighth grade, seventh. I don't know. Maybe you were like in seventh grade. I was probably in eighth grade. John was like a freshman. And we were just like, I think John was the only one that knew what it was. He's like, dude, they're shooting up. And we're all, what does that mean? I don't even, what are you talking about? Like, what are they doing? <laughs> Somehow they fucking let us off safe. I think we like got off early. Like, well, hey, we, we live right here. We oh my like, God, oh. I was just thinking about this. I'm shit you not, dude. I drove by there the other day <laughs> and I drove by and I was like, 
it's just the memory just was all because I wasn't thinking about anything. We were like talking and then I just <laughs> drive away, drove by and I was like, that's where we told them this is our spot, bro. <laughs> yeah, out here. And it was like, like lime kiln or something. Got out and we're like, have a good day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was sketchy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like tripping because I have kids now and I'm like, if they did that, I would kill them. Like, yeah, right. I'd be so mad. <laughs> Different times, bro. Different times. That's, I know that's what we keep saying, but it's like I don't. Oh man, it it wasn't that much different. Think about it. we weren't wearing seatbelts then either. Yes. Most likely, back of a pickup truck. Yeah, yeah, we were getting in the back of pickup trucks driving up that freeway, like people were or highway, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> crazy times. You ever run into the Karate Kid guy up there in Grass Valley? I think he lives in your neck of the woods. Yeah. He's probably the nicest guy in the real world. Yeah, probably for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, shit, dude. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, Todd, for lining it up and just being ooh. positive about it. And thanks to everyone in the Grass Valley skate scene. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris Sin. Shout out. Thanks, Chris Sin, for never listening to this. <laughs> Too busy <laughs> tattooing, bro. I know how it is. When you bring it, you got to sing it. Greg Carroll. Absolutely. What's the skate shop called up there now? It's not good times good, anymore. Good times. Oh, it's still good times? Yeah. Oh, but Gus doesn't have, he sold it or something. No, uh, he uh, sent a good friend of ours, took over it. That's one of the original skateboard homies, one of Chris Sin's longest time friend. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, Andy is kicking butt in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Shout out to good times. <laughs> Shout out. We got Kate, Bella, Grayson, and... Um, it's just a good scene. It's a real positive. It's uh, in a real positive chapter yeah. for it. Did, did you ever see the wood and full pipe they had there for a minute? No. <laughs> you weren't dude, living there, I don't think. It was so <laughs> gnarly, dude. There was like a window in it. And, <sighs> and we would go up there and drink. And like, I think Gordon Eckler or somebody did the <sighs> whole thing where it whips around at the board <sighs> almost. <laughs> but yeah it was crazy if you, i don't know if i can find a photo of it i'll send it to you it was it was pretty insane but he had it there at the at the warehouse right by the shop i think awesome yeah gus built a full pipe it was nuts i think it's <laughs> on like one of the first low card covers or something peabody had a photo or something okay that sounds right uh, oh and jake charbs shoot i forgot Charb. to shout out Charb. Charb. one of the he's good super good he's up here absolutely talented it's incredible rest in peace nargi fucking big Nar absolutely. wes cooper wes shout out definitely hell yeah well dude i appreciate this this was fun and thanks for yeah. um being a part of it too toad like having the three ways a nice dynamic i don't do these ones too often yeah i know glad it worked out i hope hopefully i didn't talk too much i wanted to hear hansi speak too so i'm like <laughs> i'm too i'm hyped i'm on uh everything you, you said i there's a lot of stuff i learned so i'm like this is oh, awesome yeah. <laughs> all right and maybe we'll dig out that Thanks. clip at toad and we'll put it in where you're talking like the world just needs to know the toad yeah. <laughs> the Aussie oh. it? Yeah. one thing real quick have you guys thought about that fucking tail slide to fakie at china banks how hard <laughs> that is to do like, think about sliding up there with the gap and the hang up and then coming in fakey. So fluid into the too. tranny, not out to flat, into the tranny. So fluid. So fluid. Dude, that was so <laughs> insane, dude. Yeah. It's pretty much everybody's favorite clip because when I did the China Banks documentary, I'd ask people and they'd be like, well, Phil, we already know. So, <laughs> like, you know. He was like, got the tail slide and it just wasn't like. He's like, I'm getting the tail slide to fake, you know. I wasn't there, but I was just like, dude, that is just mind blowing, dude. It's pretty much like impossible physics in my mind. <laughs> it's fucking, you know? and how fluid, like Toad said, uh, like how he did it was amazing. Well, thank you. Hell yeah, we'll talk soon. Take, stay in touch. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Hans. Yeah. Thank you, Later. I love you guys. Later. Later. Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. 
When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at TalkingSchmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. A very special shout-out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout-out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper. Keep the wheels greased.